Thanks, David, and thanks everybody for coming out tonight. This is really a, an exciting event, um, and as David mentioned, it's the second annual, and so we're, we're excited to continue on with hopefully what will become a, a long-term tradition of recognizing and celebrating the role of women in conservation in Colorado, and as David mentioned, this is, this is a um, celebration of Women's History Month, and so that's kind of the impetus behind this. Um, and National Wildlife Federation around the nation is, is doing similar events where we're trying to recognize those, those women around the country that are really taking a leadership role in conservation movement and climate action. And so we're, we're excited to gather tonight for the second annual Women in Conservation Award here in Colorado to recognize a very, uh, very particular, um, particularly worthy person who, who uh, we can celebrate. Now, we're coming together to recognize that women have really taken a lead in conservation from the beginning of the, of the conservation movement here in the United States. For example, uh, Rachel Carson is a name everybody knows and, and, and loves, and she really helped to shape the environmental and, and the conservation movement in our, in our nation. Um, as the author of Silent Spring, for example, she really brought conservation into everybody's awareness. And without that awareness that she brought, where would we be now? So that's sort of historically, but currently there are also innumerable uh, women who are playing a very large leadership role in conservation. For example, I'll bring up Gina McCarthy, uh, and in particular in terms of the climate realm, she's really made uh, the, the, the climate agenda something that is at the forefront of her efforts, including the Clean Power Plan rule, of course, and now taking on methane emissions from oil and gas industry. Um, Gina McCarthy is an example of another na of a national figure that's working uh, towards conservation and climate action. Well, we want to take this occasion of Women's History Month to the National Wildlife Federation in particular and the partners that David mentioned to come together to recognize these key conservation leaders, whether they be historic, like Rachel Carson, national, like Gina McCarthy, or here in our own backyard, like Alice Madden tonight. Um, so we're very excited to, to, to bring to the forefront the efforts of so many great people throughout the history of our conservation movement and who are taking us into the next generation of our conservation movement. Now, National Wildlife Federation is trying to take on the climate crisis in particular um, with a lot of the work that David has been doing and the network that he's built. NWF works by building and mobilizing a conservation army, we like to call it, made up of people from all walks of life who are trying to defend and protect what we consider the West's wildlife heritage which I know all of you connect with in many different ways, whether you love to go uh, fishing, whether you love to go biking and you, you see animals while you're out there, whether you just like open spaces where you can breathe fresh air and you know that there will be wild animals for you to see. We all connect with the, the West's wildlife heritage in some way. Well, NWF works with this conservation army, be it traditional conservationists, be it sportsmen, sportswomen, be it business owners, tribal leaders, or be it gardeners. We try to bring folks together to create a really strong voice for the protection of wildlife, the restoration of wildlife, and also, and this is very important, the connection of people to wildlife. Because without that connection, we're not going to be doing this in 20 years because we won't have the conservation leaders that we need for tomorrow. So we want to invite all of you to be part of the conservation army that NWF is building. Um, and as part of that, I want to remind you, we have a, a bowl there for a suggested donation of $10 so we can keep you know, both our efforts going, but also things like this, where the recognition of women in conservation can continue and grow. Please contribute if you can. Um, and also ask me or other NWF staff about what we're doing in conservation and how you can join that conservation army. So with that, I now want to um, uh, reiterate something that David said, which is last year, in our first year, we of course had Maggie Fox who many of you know and all of us respect um, as a great conservation leader and person who is uh, really accomplishing great things in climate action in the state, national, and international level. Well, we're also excited to invite other concert, great conservation leaders here tonight, and one of those is Susan Daggett, who I'm going to introduce real quickly. Uh, Susan is the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute out of the Univers University of Denver. Um, I've had the honor of working with her over the past year on of Metro Denver Nature Alliance, where we're trying to really connect kids to nature here in the Denver metro area. And Susan has the distinction of hosting the first annual Women in Conservation Award in Colorado last year. And without Susan's efforts, 
we wouldn't all be doing this today. And so I want to introduce Susan, and Susan will let us know a little bit more about the uh, awardee of tonight's Women in Conservation Award. Please welcome Susan Daggett. Wildlife Federation for um, this great idea of honoring women in conservation during Women's History Month. It's a wonderful tradition in its second year, but I believe it's the second year of, you know, 25, 50, 100. I mean, maybe there will be a time when we don't actually have to single out women for because women will be fully in charge, but um, for now, it's just awesome that we are going to shout out to women who have made a real difference in our world. Um, and I, I do think it's a really important to, to pause for a moment and take stock of the outsized role that women have played in this field, which, you know, as Brian and David said, it often has gone unrecognized. Um, you know, from Rachel Carson through to Gina McCarthy, we have a really incredible history of women in conservation. And you know, in, in addition, there are people like Sally Jewell, who is really focused on connecting kids to nature and creating that future um, conservation core and the passion among children in urban areas in particular for our natural environment and the importance of protecting it, really trying to um, infuse a spirit of stewardship um, into our kids. And there were people in between, like Frances Beinecke, who was... Um, the president of the Natural Resources Defense Council and kind of an unsung hero in the environmental movement, but she was a leader of NRDC during the years when NRDC was really charting a course towards a clean energy future and outlining what that would look like. And then of course there are people like Jane Goodall, who everybody's heard about, who's working internationally for decades to protect the great apes and the lands that they depend on. And then other people like Terry Tempest Williams, who is an incredible incredible voice for the importance of wilderness and the importance of a human connection to nature. Um, and then there's so many others, um, like all of you, truly, who are leaders in your own right, in your own communities, businesswomen, educators, mothers, who scientists, educators, women at all levels, in all kinds of ways, who are really um, infusing a spirit of stewardship in our communities, who are taking the lead and being activists and pushing for change. And truly without women taking on these roles over the last, you know, however long. I mean, certainly Jane Goodall, or I mean, uh, Rachel Carson was more than 50 years ago that she published Silent Spring. So, you know, we've been doing this for a very long time. Um, but then there's Alice Madden, <laughs> and she has been a true progressive champion in our state um, and in our nation on a whole host of issues, and I could rattle off a lot of different things that she's done that are outside of the environment energy context, but I'll focus on energy and environment as just one example of the amazing leadership that she has demonstrated. Um, she has you know, really dedicated her life to making the world a better place. Um, starting in, when I first got to know Alice, she was the Senate Majority Leader in the Colorado State Senate as a House. Oh, House. House, sorry, sorry. In the Colorado House, really playing a leadership role in um, electing Democrats to our, our legislature and leading the charge on what we now think of as our clean energy economy. And a natural transition was to serve with Bill Renner in the state government um, as his deputy chief of staff, but also as his lead on climate change and really getting the state ready to address climate change and trying to transition our state to a clean energy or a new energy future, a new energy economy. Um, she has also um, served as the Worth Chair at the University of Colorado at Denver. And in that context really took her advocacy around climate to an international scale and started working with women in particular around the world in harnessing that energy to, to make the world a better place and really helping people 
enter into sustainability related careers. In 2013, she joined the Obama administration and took a brief foray to Washington, D.C. Um, as a leader in the Department of Energy, um, helping to implement the President's Climate Action Plan and working with state and local governments and, and how to do that. And then, thankfully, she has returned to Colorado, where she um, is working to help advance clean energy solutions and working with companies and others um, as a consultant around what a clean energy technology and a clean energy future looks like. She's recently accepted a fellowship at the CU um, Law School's Getches Wilkinson Center for Natural Resources, Energy, and the Environment, where I think she's doing some of the most important work around, which is to train um, to train our young people in how to be um, in environmental leaders in the future, and really building that conservation core and those environmental lawyer activists for the future. So. Truly, I can think of no one more deserving of the role in this award than Alice Maggie. So, thank you, Alice. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to try not to blow us out. I'll try to figure it the right, right way. How many inches away from this I should be? Well, David and Brian and Susan, thank you very, very much um, for inviting me here. Really lovely introduction. Thanks so much. Um, and Jeff, I know, is here from the Alliance. Thanks for hosting us. Really wonderful. And my husband, Pete's here tonight, so it's always great when he can come down with me. Um, I thought I would, I'm not going to speak very long, so don't worry, but I thought I'd talk a little bit about my journey um, and kind of how I got here. Uh, the important women in my life along the way, and what I think some of the biggest challenges of the environmental conservation movement is, is going to be facing. Um, I'm the youngest of five, and I was kind of came of age in the 70s, so our um, dinner table conversation was about the Vietnam War and Richard Nixon. So just to give you a little flavor, there was a picture of JFK and the Pope right next to our kitchen table, so <laughs> Richard Nixon was not a, a, someone who was well thought of in my family. So I really, at a really young age, I mean like 12, I realized you have to pay attention or bad things happen. So I thought about running for office back then. Um, my first bumper sticker, which I put on my, I certainly didn't have a car, but I put it on my bulletin board, which by the way had like a little mushroom and a frog under it, this is the 1970s, and it was question authority. And I just, from a very young age, I thought, you know, there are people who will take advantage of us if we don't pay attention. Um, my second bumper sticker on that little bulletin board was no to the Merrimack Dam. And that was really my first environmental foray. I have to admit, I think it was because there was a really cute guy that was against it. And, you know, <laughs> but whatever, you know, I, I got involved. And we did stop the Merrimack Dam. I grew up in Missouri and canoed quite a bit. Um, and um, it was a silly idea that didn't happen. But that was really my first foray into environmental advocacy. And, and we were successful and it was incredibly fun. Um, so fast forward a million years, um, I'm a young lawyer and um, Pete and I decide to start a family. I've been practicing law for a couple of years. And so I, I tell my firm I'm pregnant, I'm super excited, everyone says congratulations. Right after the congratulations, the next phrase I heard was, well, you're no longer on the partnership track. So this is 24 years ago, I know things have changed, but um, it really made me question what I was doing and um, even though, you know, I, two years later, we had two small kids. That's when I got into politics. I joined the Boulder County Land Trust. I started volunteering on campaigns. My professional life was not feeding my soul. And I got involved with a lot of women's groups, too, particularly the Colorado Women's Bar. Uh, was just an amazing group of people. Um, and some of you might, you know, I know what was mentioned. I, I helped lead the takeover in, in 2004. Some of, my, uh, some of my initial motivation around that was in the minority, I served on the Ag Committee where all the environmental stuff went. And it would just get killed in the most dismissive way. You'd have common sense bills about wildlife, conservation, the environment, about transit, and it would just die. And I watched these young, valiant enviro lobbyists just get smacked around every day. And I thought, okay. This really infuriated me, basically, and if you ask my husband, that's, that's never the thing you want to do with me. So we took over the house. They never stopped coming. It was great. <laughs> um, and most people 
think about what we did in 2004, you know, there was a book written about it, but think about the money. Well, what really happened, there was a core group of women that were involved who did this amazing organization. And we got all these groups that didn't really talk to each other, progressive groups, all to sit down at a table and coordinate. And there's a group of women that no one ever mentions. Kelly Nardini's here, she was one of them. Um, yeah. I should step back and just say, before any of these other women, Jennifer Vega was really my first political mentor. I know some of you know her. She's now happily in Australia, um, away from the political life. But she really took me under her wing. And without Jennifer, I, I don't think I would have had the confidence to move forward um, on the majority effort. But a woman named Jill Hanauer, Beth Gans, Jennifer Brandenberry, and Lynn Mason were really at the core of the 2004 takeover, and their, their names are not mentioned. Sometimes I feel like the politicians are always the ones who people thank, but it's really like these amazing other people who are the Sherpas who really carry you up the mountain, so I just wanted to thank them. I have some really awesome environmental mentors too. Maggie Fox, definitely, I'm so sorry she couldn't be here tonight. She is a force of nature, uh, just, you know, mind-blowing, really. Um, Ruth Wright was one of the first real um, women I got to know in the environmental movement when I first ran for office. Someone I was interviewing with, I think Sierra Club for endorsement, said, if, if you could be a Ruth Wright, I thought, I will never be Ruth Wright. No one's ever going to be Ruth Wright. And, and I, was, I was able to build that confidence over time. Um, and again, Kelly Nordini really helped me quite a bit during that time. She was a transit lobbyist. We fought hard and really got the first state funding into transit because this woman never gets up. Um, and so we, we took over, but Bill Owens was still the governor. And uh, we decided to kind of go, I had a lot of bills vetoed for those two years, um, but we, we built a standing committee on renewable energy and environmental issues. And Judy Solano, um, a representative at that time, really took that on and ran it. So when Bill Ritter was elected, we had a silver platter of bills that, that we were able to pass together. Um, so as I got more involved with the um, environmental movement, I, I noticed pretty quickly, as we all do, that it's not very diverse. Very white, middle class. It's kind of a luxury to be an environmentalist in some case, even though poor people suffer um, uh, and usually are, you know, live near where coal plants are placed and things like that. Um, you know, you look at membership, staffing, et cetera, board memberships of environmental groups, and, it, and it's pretty white. Um, so, you know, I've certainly talked to groups about that. Um, and when I, when I went into clean energy work, it was white and male. So I decided to start, you know, doing what I do. So I would be asked to speak at a conference, and I'd look at the panel, and there'd be panel after panel, all men. Or maybe a woman would be moderating. So I'd call them up and say, Here's the names and phone numbers of five women I think you should ask to be part of your conference, because I notice it's all men. And it's hard to kind of say no to that. Well, you, you can, so what, the, it's, it's printed already, your program, you can change it online. Um, and so just starting to do things like that. And I'll tell you one funny story. Um, the Global Clinton Initiative was in Denver a couple of years ago now, and they do dinners each night. So a friend of mine had asked me to attend a dinner, which I was you know, real excited to do. And I guess um, Hillary and Chelsea and Bill would go around to these dinners. So it's on Monday night, Sunday night, I get a call from my friend who invited me. He said, do you think you could moderate the panel tomorrow night? And I knew exactly what had happened. And I just said, no. He goes, aren't you coming? And I said, yeah, I'm coming. I said, let me guess. You have all men and someone noticed. Because yeah, I just got off the phone with Bill Clinton. He said, none of us are coming to this dinner. That panel is all men, and you've got to change it. And I said, don't you think he'll see a woman being a moderator is not a really strong finch? So long story short, I was on the panel. And one of those four men had to moderate. So, um, so the, the rest of my remarks, I kind of wanted to focus on um, who I really think our future environmentalists are going to be. We're facing sort of a, an odd problem that I don't think people talk about too much, um, but our STEM majors, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, are, are, are not well represented with women. Um, I think only 11% of the physics grads are women, 11%, um, and far worse with um, under, underrepresented minorities. Um, minorities have the same interest in STEM studies when they start college, 
but they don't finish their majors. White students will be 70% per, uh, successful in finishing a, a STEM major. Um, blacks are less than, or about 42% successful in finishing that major, and Hispanics, 49%. And there's many reasons, um, but one of them has been this lack of support in the system. Um, have you ever heard of Mae Jemison? She was the first black female astronaut. She studied engineering, she's my age, she studied engineering at Stanford. And I'll just read you what she said. Um, and she, she was told oftentimes to change majors. Why don't you become a history teacher? Things like that. Some professors would just pretend I wasn't there. I would ask a question and a professor would act as if I was so dumb that it was the dumbest question he had ever heard. Then a white guy would ask the same question and that professor would say, that's a very astute observation. She said that happened to her all the time, and she was actually counseled to change majors. Um, that is still going on in the sciences. So when you think about who's, our, who's going to be doing climate research, who's going to be doing environmental science, um, our population right now is about 38% non-white. That's going to change somewhere in the late 2030s to over 50%. So we're squeezing out a, a, a large part of society from, from studying something that's not only incredibly important, that pays well, but actually will help save the planet. Um, so right now, and we talked about this before, and I know um, um, environmental organizations are, are trying to change this, but 12 to 15% of the staff of environmental foundations, nonprofits, and government agencies are people of color. That's really, really low. And, and a lot of it is interest. You know, there's just different interests or opportunity, and they haven't been exposed to it at a, at a younger age. So federal agencies are really worried about this. There's a lot of baby boomers that are going to be retiring. And who are we going to be replacing them with? If the only qualified people are white, we're just going to be, you know, this is an endless circle. Um, so I don't like to just bum people out and not have any solutions. So, um, so one of the amazing things I got to do um, when uh, I was worth chair was to get involved with some folks um, and we have students that do capstones. And actually, um, the Alliance was, our, um, was the students' um, client, and they did research in environmental literacy programs across the, the uh, middle schools and high schools in Colorado. And environmental literacy is pretty amazing. It's, it's kind of like outdoor ed, too. So you do a, a little unconventional learning around the sciences. You get kids outside, you're doing different experiments. But it had all these consequences that no one saw coming. So you get some ADD kid or a kid who's never really been outside thinking about it. Suddenly they were hearing anecdotal and then real evidence that um, these sorts of classes kept at-risk kids in school interested in science. Some of the test scores are going up and their graduation levels from high school are increasing. All because of environmental literacy. I mean, it's just amazing and it's incredibly simple. So we were able to pass a law to require it or require a plan but our State Board of Ed did that, but it's not enforced. So that's something the legislature could do to actually require that. And I probably think um, something that I'm most proud of and had so much fun doing, when I was at um, CU Denver, I, got, I joined two different National Science Foundation grants. One was, um, as Susan mentioned, working with women around the world, getting them to study sustainability. The other was working with minority students in the U.S. So for like, I don't know, the past six or seven years, every May, I go up to Murray Ranch, that's Murray, uh, Marty Murray, Murray's, Murray's place, just outside of Tetons, and we take 25 to 30 college students from around the country, and I'm talking like from the Bronx, from the LA, 80% minority membership of this class. And we, there's, a, there's faculty from all over the country who fly in on their own dime and, and teach these students. But what is really, I mean, the whole program is so amazing. You know, kids are seeing wolves and um, bears up in Yellowstone, and um, this faculty is amazing. I teach communicating science in a politicized world. Uh, but these kids start a network. And they stay networked, and they, they welcome in the new classes. So for seven years now, you know, now we have several hundred kids and graduate students that take part in this, and they are taking care of each other. And that's just the sort of thing we have to demand that happens in our colleges, that we build a network of support so students of color feel like, I belong here, there's a future for me, and that will help the entire planet. So 
that's really all of the remarks I prepared. So um, let's make sure that we are inclusive as we look at this work. It's going to take effort. It's not easy. Um, I'm thrilled that there's so many young people in the room too, um, and a lot of women here, obviously. Um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for women who, who reached back and helped me. And one of the funnest things I've ever been able to do in my life is to mentor young people, and I, I hope to continue that. So thanks so much for having me. Statewide race for CU Regents, and, and I'm, I'm mentioned the concerns I have around college. Um, but I'm happy to talk offline about that. I don't want to. Well, why, why are you running? For so, I mean, I, I went to CU. I worked there. Pete asked me to marry him at a CU football game. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are we are CU people, um, and it's something I actually thought about doing even before I ran for state legislature. Um, I love the university, I, you know, being, uh, raising kids in Boulder, it's just a huge part of your life, although we're now out in Louisville. Um, I think the debt that students are facing right now is one of the biggest problems that we have in society that we are letting continue, and it's, it's, it's breaking the backs of our young people, and it's completely ridiculous. So, looking at the system, and there's no one issue, and CU's actually done a really good job of, of being lean, but state funding, TABOR revenue limits. There's, I think there's real things that a progressive majority could do. And since you asked, I'll just say, if I do win, the board will have a progressive majority for the first time since 1979. So, <laughs> but enough about that. So, a recent survey done by environmental groups showed that a large, I think over 90% of um, minorities had not been contacted by a national environmental organization. And that goes to a lot of what you're saying. So, what are we, I'm with the National Wildlife Federation. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do? You know, it's, it's I did, a, especially as we ran campaigns, um, I did a lot of studying about that, like how you motivate people and what they care about. Um, when times are tough, people's universe of caring shrinks. So they care about jobs, economy, healthcare, education. When times are better, people feel like they can spread their wings a little bit more. So there's there's sort of that issue about, you know, um, you know, when when times are good and times are much better now, that this might be a good time to do more research or outreach rather. But I think um, you know, there, there's a program, um, Outward Bound now has Outward Bound Denver. I think that's amazing. So you're getting kids who might not ever be exposed to the outdoors to get outside. So building those early connections. Uh, my parents weren't outdoors people at all. Um, and so how do, you, how do you create the opportunity for outdoor experiences? That's why I think environmental literacy, outdoor ed, you know, sort of create that. Um, and then it's, it's, it's the hard work of reaching out. So when I was at Department of Energy, one of our so a friend of mine once said, Alice doesn't work inside the box because she's never been in the box. And so I looked at this job as, well, no one gave me a handbook, so I'll, I'll just, I worked with NASCAR and all these different groups around clean energy. And, and one group we had great success with, it was so much fun, was the NAACP. And they wrote um, a 50s state report called Just Energy. And it wasn't just about clean energy, it was about the jobs, because they realized um, you know, black students are missing out on a huge job opportunity. So really, you know, counseling students and their parents about what it might mean to go into STEM studies. Um, and then the programs I've worked on have always tried to overlay a, um, a lesson around sustainability on that, so you can get more students working in sustainability fields. So there's no one answer, but I think that's one on my way to do it. Given the difficulty with Congress, as as it is right now, they proposed holding genome copy up for treason. Are there ways to communicate 
with the other side of the island. I know you're really good at that, but a really important thing for people to understand is how do you communicate with people on the other side of the aisle so that you can make progress on common goals? <coughs> do you have any ideas? Well, about that? Susan can probably talk about that. Her husband is Michael Bennett, and I think Michael's been incredibly successful at that. Um, you know, I think it's keeping the lines of communication open. You never, I believe in strange bedfellows, you never know where you're going to have a coalition. And so, for one, I made sure never to burn any bridges because, I mean, there, there was a guy that I didn't agree with on anything. Nothing. But we, I, I did a bill, drive, drive right, pass left. We became best friends. I mean, that was his thing, you know, slow people in the left-hand lane. and. You know, I mean, it's not, not earth shattering, but um, we, we formed a bond, and then I could actually go talk to him about things because I wasn't the crazy chick from Boulder who probably wore hemp clothing. So you just have to break down some of the stereotypes that, that come along. Um, with renewable energy, one of our champions on the other side was a guy who, um, you know, if if the black helicopters ever do come and Armageddon happens, he will survive. He's got the whole kit and caboodle. But he was really upset because um, his county wasn't letting him go off grid. So he became an ally. So you really never know where you're going to build those relationships. And I think you just have to be open. A good sense of humor really helps. Going out drinking with folks, I think, helps. And people don't do that as much as they you know, used to, I think, because everything, the lines have been drawn in the sands. Um, so Leslie um, uh, I'm just, Graham, running for president, he was in the second tiers. Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay I said Leslie. Lindsay, Lindsay Graham, he, I, I was sorry when he left, because he was hysterical. I don't know if you watched the second tier debates, but he'd say things like, if I'm president, we're going to drink more. We're going to have people over to the White House, and we're going to sit down and talk about things. So I think that is, you know, the days of LBJ, you know, pulling together some crazy coalition, there they seem to be gone. But again, someone like Michael Bennett, I think has had great success with that, um, and you know has been a member of several really important coalitions.